As the United States and global pressure mounts on Vladimir Putin for the imprisonment and death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, and some Republicans are facing blowback for defending Putin and touting his government, as all that's happening, and MAGA favorite Tucker Carlson, of course, faces his own outrage over that controversial interview, tonight there is now damning new evidence on how Putin's spies are trying to infiltrate American politics again, and specifically using spies and lies to align with some Republican efforts to damage President Biden. Now, if this plot sounds familiar, it's because Russia operates ongoing plots like this. Many countries do, but one difference, which I'm going to get into in our top story right now, is how warm a reception Putin keeps getting from some American politicians on the right. Here's the news. Backed by hard evidence from an FBI and DOJ investigation, the indicted operative who was feeding lies about the Bidens to the FBI, who was cited by the Republican Party's ongoing Biden investigations, well, that indicted individual says himself that he got his materials from Russian intelligence. <clears throat> now, this is the operative and former FBI informant, Alexander Smirnov, recently indicted in that case, as mentioned, for lying to the FBI. You can see him leaving court this week in Las Vegas. He's out of custody after the U.S. took his passports. He's subject to digital location monitoring. He's presumed innocent, but faces these charges. Now, he admitted officials associated with Russian intelligence helped with his story about Hunter Biden in an FBI interview. He admits that. So that's the source. The FBI looked into those claims to determine their veracity. And obviously, they were false. Indeed, so false, they led to these charges. But top Republicans who've been hyping this for months did not look into it. It was never fact-checked. None of the characters implicated came to testify, which is something Republicans could have done. They have powers there in Congress. None of the so-called meetings in Europe locales were confirmed. No recordings ever surfaced political reports. No financial records ever showed any payments to Biden or his son. So there you have tonight a link back to Russian intelligence and an indictment and independent reporting like Politico telling you how little the Republicans did to look into this. So it'd be bad enough if just the original story was false or if Republicans could say their work was simply negligent or sloppy. But legally, this story that we've been following legally and factually has now been proven to be far worse. The supposed source that Republicans invoked is indicted for lying about the stories the Republicans hyped. And the DOJ says it ties back to a Putin program to divide and damage America. And even though that plot and the disinformation was here obviously caught and exposed, many espionage and security experts now say some of the Republicans did, knowingly or not, help Putin's bidding by pushing these lies and innuendo, sometimes at the highest levels of Congress. Even a trusted FBI informant has alleged a bribe to the Biden family. If there is bribery, high crimes, misdemeanor, we are compelled by the Constitution to move there. An alleged bribery scheme between then Vice President Biden, Hunter Biden, and a foreign national. The confidential human source who provided information about then Vice President Biden being involved in a criminal bribery scheme is a trusted, highly credible informant. Highly credible. This is a co-equal branch of government. It does its own investigations. It has subpoena power. And the evidence tonight is that those Republicans you just saw did not do anything to check if their credible informant was credible. And now the facts and the indictment show the opposite. So what do some of these same Republicans say now? Congressman Jordan argues this revelation of a foreign operation which did impact members of Congress, this revelation, he says, still does not change the facts. Jordan, what do you make of the Smirnoff indictment? Well, I mean, it is what it is, so it doesn't change the fundamental facts. Jordan is trying to argue that there are some other reasons or facts to continue probing the Bidens, even without this witness. He didn't really meaningfully address the propaganda part, the link to Russian intelligence. On the other side, the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee says this is another reason to end the Biden probe and impeachment quest. I'm restating my call to Chairman Comer, to Speaker Johnson, to fold up the tent uh, to this circus show. It's really over at this point. It feels to me as if everyone knows the impeachment investigation is over. 
So here we are. This is a big development that it ties back to Russian intelligence. And you can see how the members of Congress are responding. So before I bring in our guests, I want to walk you through where we are now. I think a sober reading of the congressional process and rules suggests that Congressman Raskin is overstating his case there. The House can continue an impeachment investigation, even if some sources or evidence goes south. The burden, though, is on Republicans to provide hard evidence. So far, they haven't, nor even explained the written grounds for the potential presidential impeachment here. Now, a sober reading of the evidence also suggests that these top Republicans like Jordan, Comer, and Grassley were at least duped by this secondhand Russian disinformation. And that's the most charitable way you can put it. They also all back a presidential candidate who goes well beyond duped. Donald Trump started this whole thing before he ever won a race, actively seeking campaign meddling from foreign governments like Russia. And those calls that he made to Russia were heeded, according to the exhaustive findings in the Mueller probe. And so here we are again, back to Russia, Russia, Russia. And I don't know how much you listen to what they say on the right, but there are a lot of Trump apologists who claim it's their opponents who are obsessed with Russia. And that that's why all of this keeps coming up. Like it's a thing that other people are obsessed with. Well, let me tell you, with this Russian disinformation campaign partly exposed tonight, that that idea that other people are obsessed with Russia, like so much MAGA political projection, has it exactly opposite. So why are we back on Russia tonight? In our Congress, in the news, in America? I'll go through it quite briefly. One, because Putin's an autocrat who runs these operations on an ongoing basis. He's not just going to stop. Two, because Trump and part of the Republican Party use or even actively welcome some of the fruits of those campaigns. They're made to target our process, and some people in the American political process welcome it. Three, there's a whole group of operatives who profit off Putin and his associated interests. Some were ultimately convicted for corrupt acts, like the person you see on your screen, who's not some random felon. He was the number one person on the Trump campaign when they won in 16. He's former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort, convicted in the Mueller probe. Now, that's three. Four, Trump's long, loud defenses of Putin have laundered and popularized him as a figure on the right. And that has consequences for everything from foreign policy to our fellow Americans' views or understanding of how much authoritarianism they can actually stomach. For Mr. Carlson, who is very relevant here, whether you like it or not, as one of MAGA's most prominent voices on Russia, well, Tucker Carlson could stomach Putin's record as recently as last week. I'll show you what I mean. He responded to a question posed about Putin's tactics, about jailing a dissident we've told you about, Navalny, who was then still believed to be alive. Tucker was asked about that right after his Putin interview. And the New York Times reports asked why he had not questioned Putin about Russia's free speech crackdown, Navalny's jailing, or suspected political assassinations, they mean in general, Carlson said those were the things that every other American media outlet talks about. Times noting Carlson was actually the first Western media figure to interview Putin in over two years. But Carlson responded, quote, leadership requires killing people. Sorry, that's why I wouldn't want to be a leader. Okay, well, there is more than one way to be a leader. That's the whole point. And the Times also reports a, quote, notable change as Carlson then later this week responded to Navalny's death in Russian custody, saying, quote, it's horrifying what happened to Navalny. The whole thing is barbaric and awful. No decent person would defend it. So no decent person would defend the Putin system that led to Navalny's death, yet Carlson was defending that Barry system last week. Okay. So they can try to make sense of that. Now, some of what Putin does, especially within his borders, is not easily stopped by other countries. Russia is a nuclear-armed adversary that invades its neighbors. But what is notable here and avoidable, what is not normal and what does not need to happen, is how much of what Putin continues to do within American borders 
is minimized or even sometimes welcomed by some of the most prominent conservatives in public life and government.